Hey everyone, today we are at a very important historical site that was first settled by Europeans way back in the early 1700s. Before that, it was inhabited by the Susquehannock and the Delaware Indian tribes. This is Fort Hunter Mansion and Park, located in Dauphin County, Pennsylvania. I feel that this park is in some way a microcosm of the history of the United States all in one place. The mansion is built on a bluff overlooking the confluence of the Fishing Creek and the Susquehanna River, roughly six miles north of the state capital of Harrisburg. Throughout its history, it has served as a hub for frontier commerce, a war fort, and an exclusive private estate. Today, it is a public park, and the mansion itself is now a museum. In 1725, Benjamin Chambers first settled this area but went on to found the area now known as Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So the property was turned over to his brother-in-law, Samuel Hunter, which included both a grist mill and a sawmill, and thus it became known as Hunter's Mill. Sitting on the site of the current Fort Hunter Mansion was the location of a very important French and Indian War stockaded blockhouse or supply fort, about 10 feet by 14 feet in size. It was commissioned to be built immediately after the massacre at Penn's Creek in 1755 and was commanded by Captain Thomas McKee and Captain James Patterson. It was built in 1756 and used until the end of the hostilities in 1763. It was used to protect the frontier settlers and to ship supplies from Philadelphia to Fort Augusta in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. A bend in the river made this a very strategic and important location and after the end of the war, it was left to decay. Captain Archibald McAllister purchased the land in 1764 and built a blacksmith shop, school, grist mill, sawmill, and a tavern on site, everything that one would need to be self-sufficient at the time. There are some beautiful gardens and, sm and a small spring house that sit just behind the mansion. There is also an ice house just behind the garden, which was built in 1810. This is where blocks of ice that were cut from the river were stored and packed in sawdust to be used as refrigeration throughout the summer months. The mansion as we know it today was built in three different phases or sections. The first was a log cabin built in 1786. Then in 1814, the federal style front section was added and lastly, in 1870, the rear wooden summer kitchen was added. The mansion tour is the only part of the park where there is an admission fee, otherwise everything else is free to visitors. The house was preserved in the 1930s, and everything inside the house is, an, is original. Tours of the mansion are offered daily during the spring, summer, and fall, with the exception of being closed on Monday. In this view, we see the center section, which was the original log cabin, and the rear summer wooden kitchen, which was added later. In a dark period of history at Fort Hunter, from 1786 through 1831, over 20 enslaved people lived and basically ran the day-to-day -day operations of the mansion. Some of the buildings that are here were built by slave labor, and there's actually a slave cemetery on site behind the Everhart Covered Bridge. One really nice touch that I noticed on my visit was that many of the trees around the mansion had plaques labeling the species or types of trees. And in fact, two of the sycamore trees here are estimated to be over 300 years old and among the oldest trees in the state. As we cross the road that splits the park from north to south, we will come to a large field. Here in 1870, Daniel Dick Boas of Harrisburg purchased the property along with his son, John Riley, and operated the dairy farm here for over 50 years. They added the centennial barn that we see here in 1876 to house all of the animals needed for the dairy. It is built in the Gothic German bank barn style and now can be rented out for functions such as weddings or outdoor festivals. The corn crib that is next to the centennial barn was built around 1880 and is elevated to deter hungry rodents from getting to the corn. During this time, they increased the amount of land they owned to 1,500 acres to support the dairy farm. Mrs. Margaret Meigs, 
a niece of John Riley's, is credited for setting up the Fort Hunter Foundation in 1956 and is the founder of the Fort Hunter Museum and Park. As we walk across the field in front of the Centennial Barn, we come to the Tavern House, which was also known as the Practical Farmer. It was built around 1800 and is where Captain McAllister sold his whiskey and housed overnight travelers. It was also used for a time as a community center for the local farmers and later to house the farm hands of the dairy milking crews. It is restored to circa 1870. After an extensive restoration project, the Tavern House won a preservation award from the Harrisburg Historical Society in 1996 and looks like it's been very well maintained ever since. There seems to have been a few additions throughout the year on this side of the building and of course you couldn't have a tavern without its own privy. Take a look and see what this is some kind of shed or cellar of some sort. Let's see. Spring House, circa 1900. Very nice. So we can take a quick peek inside. See if there's anything we can see in here. Definitely cold storage. spring as it ran through the spring house and exited right there. structure was stone all the way around and maybe the clapboard uh, was added at a later date. Again, very well maintained. Looks like they put a new metal roof on it. Uh, looks like this was built around 1810. Let's see if we can walk around and Take a baby a peek inside the window. We're here on a Saturday, everything's closed, but maybe during the week we might be able to get inside and take a look at some of these things. Seeing what their visitor hours are and coming to take a look during the week. Some very nice colors on the trees here. This is getting towards the end of October, the peak foliage season. and peaceful here, not too many people. Looks like they also have a small covered bridge over here on the side. But let's look at the other side of the uh, stable house here first. Nice stone work. Very well maintained. Looks like this might be some kind of water trough that they had for the animals. Of 1928. There's another view of the big barn over on the other side, the Centennial Barn. We'll take another look at that when we walk by here in a little while. It's called the Everhart Bridge. It's over a little intermittent stream or dried up creek. Not sure what was here originally or if this was the uh, original location for the bridge. It says it was built in 1881 and spanned the Buffalo Creek, which I think it must have been relocated. This is not the original location of the bridge, but uh, they did a very nice job of 
gonna get him set in here for us. Again, very well maintained structure. Beautiful covered bridge. Looks to be, I know we look at the sign, probably tells us how long it is, but I would say, looks like it's probably, uh, I'd say, maybe 40 to 50 feet long. Uh, the main span there. Let's take a look at this end of it. Construction of the bridge. Um, view out the windows on the side. There's uh, restrooms and a playground there for the kids. Uh, very nice park overall. I would assume it gets pretty crowded in the summer, but right now it's very lovely. Beginning in 1826 and completed in 1834. The landings for the supply barges at the south end of the park were converted into the entrance for a section of the Pennsylvania Canal. This part of the canal stretched 43 miles and was an integral part of the trade expansion westward. The canal and towpath go just behind the Everhart Bridge's new location and is now the site of the park's natural swamp area, which is home to numerous indigenous plants and wildlife. A beautiful setting here. Absolutely gorgeous. Train trestle over there, the train going over the river. In some pretty nice colors. And the hills there on the other side of the river. Oh goodness, as we're looking up the river here towards the north. Around. And the park continues down along the river for quite a ways here. You can walk for as far as you want towards Harrisburg. And some more magnificent colors. From the mansion area, visitors can stroll down a nice paved pathway along the Susquehanna River, past some nice picnic pavilions, down to the Hecton Church, which sits on the south end of the park. It was built in 1885, and it was a Methodist church and operated as such until 1990. It was moved to its new location in 2009 to avoid future floods along the river. Looking south from the church, you can see the historic Rockville Bridge, the longest masonry stone railroad bridge in the world spanning over the Susquehanna River, just down from Fort Hunter. Unfortunately, the videos of the church and the bridge that I took did not come out, so I am sharing these photographs instead. Well, that's the tour. Thanks for watching. If you've made it this far, then you must be really into history like I am. I hope you enjoyed and learned something about this beautiful and historical park. If so, please consider subscribing to the channel. It would really help me out and it would let me know if you would like to see more videos like this in the future. If I missed anything, or if you have anything to add, please put it in the comments down below. And as always, I hope to see you at the next time, because as you know, you never know what you're going to see when you get out and explore with John.